Glad you're here tonight. If any of you do not have a copy of the Outlines and Notes by Dennis Cole, uh, I, I read off copies of these for you just to have as a uh, an added tool in studying. You don't have to, but if anybody wants a copy of the study guide, they're ten dollars a piece. You can, you can, or you don't have to. We're going to be going through the book, but sometimes. We've had people that like to read that along with it, and if you do, we've got some uh, for your use. Uh, I'll pass these out in just a little bit, but uh, there's an attendance sheet going around. If you'll sign your name to it, that'll help us to know how many we have and, uh, and get us started that way. Okay, there's a pen going along with it. We'll put back in the cow class when we're through. <laughs> I borrowed it from them. I took my coat off. I'm, I'll leave my tie on for right now. I'll never forget, I had a professor at Louisiana College, a, a math teacher, that uh, it was so interesting because he had this routine he followed. Every class period, he'd come in, he had his coat and tie on, He'd first take the coat off, put it on the back of the chair, then he'd take his tie off and put it over the top of the coat. Then he'd get started with the class. One day he came in and did not have his coat or tie on. He looked around. He said, I'll be back in a minute. He only lived a couple of blocks from the school. But he walked <laughs> home, got his coat, put his tie on, came back in the classroom, stood before us, took the coat off, put it on the back of the chair, took the towel, put it over that, and then he was ready to teach. Uh, I guess it's like some of these coaches, that they're gonna wear the same clothes, or Bear Bryant wore the same cap uh, or hat, uh, uh, you know, it's just part of their way of doing things, and I guess we all have that uh, in, our, in our way of doing things. But uh, glad you're here for this study. Uh, I'm always, uh, a bit nervous starting this because where do you begin and, and we have to just stop in my mind anyway uh, we're studying numbers in Sunday school moving to Jeremiah on Sunday nights now for the next month and when you're reading especially those two uh, there's some things that you're seeing in Jeremiah some of the conclusion of things that are going on with the conquering of the promised land and the division of the land among the tribes and those kind of things it's, it becomes mind-boggling. I have to stop and separate this in my mind to, to be able to move forward. But uh, glad you're here, and we want to begin with a word of prayer as we ask for God's help in our study. Heavenly Father, we cannot thank you enough for what you do on a daily basis to help us to get to know you better. You show us in your creation. You move upon our lives in various ways to make yourself known. You make yourself known through your word to us as well. And I pray that we will take note, listen to you, and obey you. We know from Jeremiah's experience, not only was this important in his own life, but it was, was vitally important and needful for the children of Israel. And I pray that we will learn not just what Jeremiah was leading and teaching, preaching to the people, but that we'll help, it'll help us understand our own day and what's needed for us as well. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jeremiah follows Isaiah. Generally, the prophecies that are given in the latter part of the Old Testament are called the major prophets and the minor prophets. Actually, the only reason that's named that is because of the length of the prophecies, not the importance of the prophecies. They're all important. Any word from God is important for us to know. Oh, by the way, in case you're wondering why the camera, Richard's trying to record this so that we can upload it onto live stream and it'll be in the archives for the benefit of those that cannot come. Uh, normally we have a live stream Sunday morning and Sunday night, as you know, but uh, we're not able to go live from here. So it's for this reason that he's doing that. And I appreciate Richard doing this for us. But all prophecies are important. 
manner because they're shorter. Typically, also, as you go through the prophecies, uh, the, the longer ones are first. That would let us know that Isaiah is longer than Jeremiah, except in the Hebrew, it's not. Uh, the Hebrew wording, Jeremiah is actually a little longer than Isaiah. So, you know, there, again, that would kind of blow the uh, understanding that they're from the longest to the shortest as far as the prophecies are concerned and, and the order they put them in. It's not in the order of how the prophets came, but in the order of the length of the prophecy, typically in the scriptures. As we come to Jeremiah, I'm not sure how much you've read or how many times you might have read Jeremiah, but it begins with uh, Jeremiah as a tadpole. And he comes along and continues to grow until that point when someone decided to write a song about him. <laughs> Jeremiah was a bullfrog. I saw some of your mouths drop when I started with this tadpole thing. No, that's not this Jeremiah. I just thought, y'all thought the preacher lost his marbles, didn't you? Where in the world has he gone? What did he have for lunch or whatever, you know? No, I know the difference between the two Jeremiahs. And the bullfrog was a separate character than this Jeremiah. But every time I think about Jeremiah, that song pops in my head. I don't know about you, but Jeremiah the bullfrog popped in my head. So I just felt like I needed to start off with Jeremiah as a tadpole growing into a mighty bullfrog. Well, not this Jeremiah. Okay. So that gets that one out of the way so that we can settle down on who this Jeremiah is. God calls Jeremiah. He's of a priestly family. Uh, but as far as we know, because he's still in his youth, he has not been trained for the priesthood yet. He's not serving as a priest. But he's of the family of, of, of the priestly tribe and would normally have fallen into that as a, a vocation of life. But God calls him to be a prophet of his. And the job that he calls him to do is an incredibly uh, challenging job. Uh, and I think what helps us as we study Jeremiah is to see that when God calls us to a task, it's not going to be most of the time in easy circumstances, but difficult circumstances. And yet Jeremiah shows us from his faithfulness to God and what goes on that even in the most challenging of circumstances, you can be faithful to God and be used of God. That's Jeremiah. Look at verses 1 through 3 of chapter 1 as we begin to just explore who he is and, and this calling in his life. He said, The words of Jeremiah, the son of Helkiah, of the priest, who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 30th or, no, excuse me, the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Now, I'm going to pass out a chart that we'll look at a little bit more uh, later. If somebody could help me get these around. That would keep me from having to, there's two, one, two, I'll just divide them up like this. You can subdivide them among yourselves if you'd like. There you go. This chart will show you, with all of the prophets, how Jeremiah fits in to the scheme of things. Get my chart out here. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and deal with it now. These were very turbulent times in in their in their country. Judah's history has has uh, 
has some turbulent times. Let me go back even beyond this while they're passing those out to share with you that Solomon following Solomon's reign the kingdom was divided you have 12 tribes that are divided into two kingdoms you have the two tribes called most of the time referred to as Israel or Judah. You have ten tribes that go their separate way that are most of the time referred to as Ephraim. What's the other name for them? You better remember, I'm, I'm pulling a blank. Northern Kingdom. Northern Kingdom. No, just mainly the Northern Kingdom. This was the Northern. They were called Israel. Well, this one, all right, yes. This was Israel, also called Ephraim. And, and this was uh, Judah, or also the Southern kingdom. The reason for the division, if you remember Solomon, as I even referred to in my message this morning, though he was known as the wisest man who ever lived, shows in, his, in the end times of his life lack of wisdom, as he had 300 wives, 700 concubines, and the, if you go back and read the responsibility of the tribes just to feed his family became overbearing to the people. I mean, that, you know, we're talking about just a thousand wives and concubines, not counting the children. And, and all of these people had to be fed by the kingdom. And as, as I said, it became a task that was greater than what uh, the people wanted. Uh, they were doing it, but when Solomon dies and his successor, Jehoiakim, when I do it was? Yeah, Jehoiakim takes over. Uh, his advisor, he said, what should I do about this? The older advisor said, look, the people are tired of all of this. They can't bear up under this burden anymore. You need to lighten the load on them. The younger advisor said, hey man, you're the king. You need to keep on. In fact, you ought to make it even more difficult on these people so that they will stay behind you and know that you're the king. Well, the young advisors won out. He made things more difficult. The kingdom split, and uh, he had hardly anybody then. He goes with the northern kingdom. No, he stays with the southern kingdom. And when he dies, his son Jehoiachin takes over. Uh, but this... The northern kingdom never had one good king. Every one of them continued to lead the people away from God. The southern kingdom, on the other hand, would have a good king ever so often, which would bring them back to fearing God and serving God, which would allow you know, God's patience with them bore a little bit longer. And but judgment is coming for sin. And as a result of that, the northern kingdom goes into bondage to the Assyrians actually about 186 years before the southern kingdom will finally go into bondage. Southern kingdom, again, because of some good kings along the way, Josiah being one of those when God calls Jeremiah to begin uh, serving as a prophet of his. You can see that from that chart when his reign begins. The fall of Israel was 722. You have prior to that the prophets who had uh, warned the, the northern kingdom in particular, Amos, Jonah, Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, 
was before, but he continued to prophesy. Then you see where Nahum uh, picks up, uh, and, and again, these Nahum on down, these prophets are prophesying to the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom has already gone into bondage, and the southern kingdom is teetering on bondage. When they have a good king who brings them back, then uh, closer to a walk with God, then God gives them a little bit more time. But then a bad king would come along again, and the amazing thing to me, you'll see time after time that they'll name the king and it says, and he was worse than the one before him. <laughs> you know, it, instead of just being bad, they kept getting worse. Worse and worse and worse. Uh, there was a little boy said, worser and worser. <laughs> If you want to use that. But uh, so from, from, and Isaiah began to prophesy toward the southern kingdom too, uh, as his prophecies continued on. Uh, but you have this period of time before the southern kingdom will fall in 586. Now, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi all come after they've gone into bondage. There's a whole new reason why God used them to prophesy to a people who are already in bondage. But he did. And, uh, and we'll get to those studies at a later point. But Jeremiah is prophesying to the southern kingdom that if you don't come back to following God, the same thing that happened to the northern kingdom going into bondage to those uh, 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 Assyrians is going to happen to you. Now, keep in mind, when the southern kingdom goes into bondage, how many years is it that God says you're going to be in bondage? Seventy. Seventy years they're going to be in bondage. These have already been in bondage for about 186 years plus the 70 that they're going to be there. Uh, what's that? 256 years that these were in bondage under the Assyrians and then the Babylonians. It'll finally be the Persian Empire that will come along and, uh, and, and overcome the, the Babylonians. And the interest, ba Babylon ruled with an iron club. The Persians ruled with a carrot. They allowed you to have some freedoms. Their, their thought was, if we give you some things that you want, you want to be loyal to us and serve us. So that's what I mean by they ruled with a carrot. That's when you get Nehemiah and some of those folks, uh, well, others before him even, but finally, they've been back. It's, the Persians are still in control. They've allowed some of the people to go back to Jerusalem to try to rebuild it, and nothing's getting done. There's, there are people around the city that don't want it rebuilt. It's in shambles, and we'll talk about that when we get to that point of, of their of finally the southern kingdom being taken into bondage and what happened. But uh, you know, Nehemiah finally is used of God to come back and at least get the wall built around the city and to get the uh, temple built so that they'll have a place of worship. And again, the word he kept getting, he had never been there. He had been born and reared in, in bondage. But he loved, and Israel is very nationalistic, even today. If you study anything about their history, they're very nationalistic. And, and homeland is important to them. And Nehemiah kept asking everybody that would come along because he was the, the uh, food taster and the, the drink taster for the king. Make sure nobody would poison him. He'd drop dead first. That was his, that was his responsibility. But he was in a location, a position, to hear people coming through to talk about what's going on in other parts of the kingdom or of the world of that day. And he keeps asking those who are coming along, what's going on in Jerusalem? Nothing. Everybody was despondent. And, uh, you know, finally he asked the king, can I have time off? He didn't say permanently leave you, but can I have some time off to go 
and with your blessings and with your assistance, because the king gave him that time off, gave him letters that would allow him to get wood from the cedars of Lebanon and other things that he would need to help get things going in Jerusalem and the ability to go and get started. Again, there was a lot of opposition. That was another study too. But just know that these are the things that are going on in the world of that day. <coughs> Something else that's interesting, while these folks, 256 years is a long time to be separated from your homeland. Long enough that a lot of generations have come along and even forgotten about the homeland and God's promises and everything else. That's why God continued to send other prophets to remind the people. But in the course of living among others, which is what the Assyrians and the Babylonians did as they would bring them out of their own land, many of these people married into the, intermarried with the folks of the people they were living with. That's what started the line known as the Samaritans. And the Jews hated the Samaritans, as you remember. You come on down in the New Testament years. Even in Jesus' time, they'd go around the city of uh, the country of Samaria uh, because they hated them so much. They'd take a longer route. I mean, it wasn't like you had uh, vehicles. You had to walk or ride a donkey or something, or maybe a camel. And, and a longer trip just made that task even harder, but they were willing to do that. It shows the hatred they had for the Samaritans. Uh, they were of Jewish ancestry, partly, but because they had the blood of foreigners in them too, the Jews hated them because they believed you ought to stay separate from anybody else. And, and, but just to let you know, that's where all of the, the, the Samaritan line came from. Of course, some of these eventually, they were only in bondage 70 years though. This group was in bondage 186 years plus, continued in bondage when the southern kingdom was taken in until finally they were given some freedom. But not everybody left to go back to Jerusalem. What did anything there to go back to? It was going to be difficult work to be able to try to rebuild it. And as I said with uh, Nehemiah, years had gone by, nothing had been done, and the people who had gone back were down because they had all these glowing thoughts in their mind. Hey, we're, we're able to go back. We're going to go back. We're going to build the city. We're going to build our houses. And we're going to have things back like we used to have it. Anybody ever tell you you can't go back to where you used to be and it be just like it was? You can't, can you? Even if you go back to the place where you were born or reared today, it's going to be different from what, what it was when you were there. It will be. And a, long, a lot of years had gone by. Even 70 years is a lot of years. You go off and leave a place for 70 years and come back to it and see what's happened to it. And Jerusalem had been left in shambles 70 years earlier. And you can imagine with 70 more years on top of everything being destroyed, what it must have looked like when those first people went back. Have you ever seen little trees grow up in the concrete and tree in the mortar? It'll just begin to tear it all down on it. And uh, that's why you don't want grass growing up in the, the uh, crevices of your concrete because even grass will eventually break it all up if you leave it there long enough. That's what was going on. This is the period of time that Jeremiah is called of God to serve. And it's in the middle of Josiah's uh, kingship. So we'll get on to that in a few minutes. But just to give you a little bit of what is happening. Uh, what makes a prophet a genuine or trustworthy prophet? Do you remember what scripture tells us? If his prophecy comes true. Usually, the prophecies would be given such from God that there would be a short-term prophecy such that the people could see that this came to pass, so we better listen to this person concerning those things that are going to take longer to come to pass. And, and Jeremiah was a true prophet of God. He received his revelation directly from God and then proclaimed it, typically verbatim, 
to the audience that God specified for him. There's something about Jeremiah, though, that makes it difficult, especially for those of us who've been reared in America. We're, we've been reared under a Greek culture. We're used to things going chronologically. The chapters of Jeremiah are not in chronological order. The first part of Jeremiah are sermons that God gave him, prophecies that he gave him to preach to the, to the people. And they're in no particular order. Uh, you, you see some of that in the outline that's given here <coughs> of the book of Jeremiah. That's got a little better orderliness to it than is really there. Keep in mind it wasn't written down as they went along the way. This was not written down until they got toward the end. And God tells him to go back and write it down. And Jeremiah dictates this to Baruch, his friend, who actually does the writing. Do you remember what they do with it then? Take it to the king. Read it to the king. The king's sitting there warming by the fire and he's listening to this being read and he hates what he's hearing. And he takes his knife and he starts cutting it up, throwing it into the fire. Baruch goes back and tells Jeremiah, I don't have it anymore. The king burned it. And God says to Jeremiah, well, write it again. And we're going to add an appendix to it this time. <laughs> I added that word, but I mean they added a little more to it that time uh, so that the king will get the message from God. So, so what I'm saying to you, <coughs> even with the messages that were written, it was all the initial was all burned. I had to go back and write it again. <coughs> and then that was not burned. The second copy wasn't. So you can see from the manner in which it was given by God and even presented to the people and then written down how it could not fall in a chronological order. It would be very easy for it to not be uh, chronologically given to us. Uh, Jeremiah, as a prophet of God, was told that he would see with clarity and he saw that the sins of the people were a big deal. And he saw that ongoing sins actually were downright dangerous as well. And he came to a point of understanding how much God loved his people and, uh, and wanted them to repent so that the, the judgment for the sins of the people would not come upon them. And he wanted to, to help take care of it. So, again, as I said, this is during a turbulent time in the history Alrighty, I, I better cool down just a little before I drink it. That's hot coffee. If I turn that up right now, I'll not make it. Anyway, <laughs> let me just take an interlude here to tell you. I have come to realize in the last week or two following the surgery I had that the tickle I have now is not due to sinus drainage as much as it is dryness. And once they did the surgery, a lot of those problems have cleared up. But as you're talking and you're breathing in drier air, I develop a tickle in the throat from the dryness of the air. I hate to stand and drink before you. So, and I put, even put them in in my pocket. I hadn't, I forgot to pull it out and put it in my mouth. And I found also on Sunday mornings, I put them in in my mouth beginning of the worship service. Guess what happens to that by the beginning of the sermon time? It's gone. So I'm going to have to start putting an extra one in my mouth, I guess, to help keep it <coughs> moist. <laughs> and of course, I'll be careful not... Okay, I need that spray, huh? Okay, I need to be careful not that I don't put a button in my mouth. You heard about the preacher that, that did that. He always put a mint in his mouth to begin, and when that mint was gone, he knew it was time for the sermon to be over. And that particular Sunday, he kept preaching and kept preaching and kept preaching. That mint never would go away. 
Finally, he stopped anyway, and he realized he had a button in his mouth. It wasn't a mint after all. So I'll be careful not to put a mint in my mouth <laughs> and try to judge the length of the sermon based on whether it's a mint or a button. So, but anyway, <coughs> just to let you know what's going on. Um, okay. Okay, if you look back at your charts, let me make one more comment with regard to that. You see from the top of that chart that Jeremiah began his ministry while Assyria was in control. As I said, they're the ones who took over the northern kingdom. And he, it ended with the Babylonians in power. And this was a transition that impacted Judah tremendously. Part of it's the fact that the Assyrians are in control, but they are diminishing in power while the Babylonians are gaining strength in power. The children of Israel tried to join up with the Assyrians because they're the ones in power and we're kind of under them, so we, we, we need to be on their side, but it began to go backwards for them. And even Egypt then wanted, and the the route that you would go from where the Assyrians were kind of to the north, if you're looking at the end of the, here's the Mediterranean, well, I don't know what mark. The Mediterranean like this, and here's, here's the Holy Land area, let's just say in this region. You've got Egypt down here. You had Assyria that was based more this way, Babylon more this direction. The only route was to go through Judah to get there. The Egyptians, on their route to, uh, to help join up with the Assyrians, to help fight off the Babylonians. And the, the, at that point, the people of Judah, Josiah the king, did not want them to go through there. They resisted, and that's when Josiah is killed. The, their armies, and Josiah the king is helping lead them, but anyway, the Egyptians kill them. They become then a vassal of the Egyptians, Judah does. And it will be later that, uh, that Babylon will come down and, and will be the, the next empire of the world and, and take over all of it. But that's, that's what happens to Josiah. And this is the only route you can go. You've got to come through Judah either way. And, and, uh, and with Israel being there in the center, it put them right in the middle of, of a lot of the fighting that was going on. And according to what, you know, they didn't know what side to get on. Should have gotten on God's side. That's what cost them. Because they tried to make agreements with the enemy instead of trusting in God. You're going to see that as we get into the prophecies themselves. That's what becomes their downfall. They thought we can make alliances with the people, with these nations, and it's going to help serve us in a good way. And God was saying all along, look, I am supposed to be your God. You're supposed to rely totally on me. And they wouldn't do that. Again, a big part of the downfall that they had. So, uh, again, it's, it's a very difficult time for them as he comes on the scene. Josiah is the king, but he's going to be killed shortly thereafter. And the next king that follows him forgets the reforms that Josiah had brought along. Josiah's daddy and grandfather, kings before him, had both been evil kings. Out of that, you, it's amazing that Josiah would be the kind of king that would want to bring them back to worshiping God and being faithful to God. Jeremiah goes along with Josiah initially, thinking that Josiah really is doing good in what he's doing, but he begins to see that it's only superficial. And then, and part of the reform was to remodel, rebuild the, the temple. And you recall how it was in the, uh, in the remodeling of that that they found a copy of the, the scrolls of the book of the law that had been lost. They found it, they brought it to Josiah, read it to him, and Josiah said, look, 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 everybody needs to hear this. 
They stopped construction immediately, called it an assembly of all God's people, and it was read in the hearing of everyone. This is what God says, this is what we need to do. And that's when things really began to step up in, in wanting to be more faithful to God. It's a shame that Josiah got killed. He might have been able to lead them on in an even closer walk with God, <coughs> but he failed to do so because he, he was killed in that battle, as I said. <coughs> and and uh, the next king after him forgot the reforms of Josiah and went right back uh, the, in the opposite direction. Uh, the circumstances never got better for Jeremiah either. As I said, after Josiah's killed, things get worse. Josiah's messages become, or let me back up, Josiah's messages so anger the people, he's not even allowed to go into the temple. And the people hate him too. The, he's part of the kingly family, but he's not even allowed to go into the temple to read or to share the messages of God. And the people are against him. He's caught in the middle. Nobody wants Josiah. Nobody wants to hear what Josiah has to say. So what's Josiah going to do? When people are against you, and God says, if you don't do what I tell you to do, I'm going to be against you. Will our fear of God overcome our fear of people? All right, let me back up just a second then. We know that God says we're to be witnesses for him, don't we? One of the biggest reasons people don't do that is fear. That's what we're told. That's what people say. Afraid of what people might say, how they might respond. When God tells us to do something, to go and be his witnesses, he didn't say it was an option. You shall be my witnesses. He didn't say that's the job of some people. If you're a child of God, that's the duty of all of us, isn't it? So if it's a command of God that we do, who are we going to fear more? God or people? God. We ought to fear God more, shouldn't we? And be obedient to what God wants. But so often, what I'm trying to say is, and, and sharing what Jeremiah faced with what we face as well, Jeremiah faced the same dilemma. <clears throat> Everybody likes to be liked. We want people to like us. And here Jeremiah is being hated by the people of the temple as well as the people in general because of the messages he's preaching. Lord, maybe I need to change my message a little bit. No, God says, I'm giving you what I want you to say to the people. And he was obedient to God, which left him all alone to a great extent uh, in his prophesying. So you have an unusual person here. Did you know that, that in Jeremiah, the, the prophecies of Jeremiah, we know more about the author and the person the, the author of this, of course, is God. But we know more about Jeremiah as a prophet than we do any of the other prophets. He tells us more in his prophecies about himself than we have about Isaiah or any of the others. It's an interesting footnote concerning him. And uh, it, it, so in this book, we've got a series of sermons discourses, symbolic actions, and prophetic utterances. And uh, it, it, it was written to demonstrate the authority and re reliability of God in sharing his word with his people. And the prophecies contained in Jeremiah find their full and complete realization in the coming of, of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, because it continues to point to the inevitable judgment of God over sin. And that didn't end <coughs> with the fall of Judah. It's still God's message. God's going to judge sin. All sin will be judged. 
No sin is ever swept under the rug and forgotten. And when Jesus came and paid the price for our sin, the choice then for us is will we accept his payment and ask forgiveness or will we reject that payment and when you're rejecting it, you're saying to God, I'm wanting to pay for my own sin. Because all sin's got to be paid for. We'll either pay for it for an eternity and separation from God in a place that was prepared for the devil and his angels, a place called hell, or we'll find the forgiveness of God and we'll spend eternity with him in heaven because our sins have been forgiven. No sin is ever overlooked. And I know in, in our minds, the little sins, I mean, are the, let me start on the other hand. Those big sins, those bad sins are the things that everybody else does. The things that we do are those little things. They're, they're not the big sins. The only problem I have with that, I never find in God's word a separation of large and small sins. In fact, the one verse in the Bible that just points that out to me every time I see it is Revelation 21.8, where he's naming the whoremongers and the idolaters and the adulterers and all of these, and then he throws liars right in the middle of the mix. He's naming all of these. They're going to spend eternity in hell. And he says, and he comes on down, and all of these, and liars. And I think, oh, wait a minute. That's the one we, we call little because we, they're not bad. We call them white lies. You know what I mean? That means they're not bad like those big black lies, I guess. Is a white lie better than a black lie? <laughs> Again, I haven't found a distinction in God's word about that either. So what I'm saying is, in God's eyes, sin is sin. And all sin has to be paid for. And the choice is ours, whether we're going to accept the payment of God, which was Jesus' death on the cross, or reject that and say, but I'll pay for my own sins. And because we can't be bad enough, we can't go through enough torture, we can't go through enough difficulty to pay for any sin, we'll spend an eternity trying. And it never will happen. Because you can't, can't forgive your sins. You can't go through enough to forgive your sins. And as a result of that, we'll spend an eternity separated from God. So, that's where we are as we begin and see an overview of this prophet. And we're going to take a break for about 15 minutes, and then we'll begin to call you back. If you've still got something to drink at that point or eat at that point, bring it on to the table with you. As you all know, this is going to be a, an informal time for us. If you've got questions, feel free to ask. Uh, you can even add in to the things that we're sharing. But... Uh, I knew tonight was going to be more introductory of the whole thing as we get into the specifics of the prophecies. So let's have just a brief word of prayer. We appreciate those who've prepared our fellowship committee and what they've prepared for us tonight. And uh, if you want to assist them by bringing something one night, just let them know and uh, we'll be glad for that to be uh, made available as well. Father, we do thank you for your love. We're no better than the people of Jeremiah's day. We still fall into the same pitfalls. <coughs> still face many of the same decisions. But Lord, we know, even because of their experiences, what we should do. We know that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You do not change. So what was expected of them is expected of us as well. Bless this food now to nourish us and to help us even as we enjoy a fellowship time with one another is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Take a break. <laughs>